Okay, so question for when we do the panel. If we turn that one on, does this one need to be off? Should be far enough the way Okay. And if it is, it ends up being that way, then we'll coordinate away with the two mics. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's still morning, technically. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. I'm Melissa Ziegler. I work for TCC as our coordinator of organizational learning. And yeah, Ooh, thank you. Uh, and I also teach psychology on the side. So if you're a student here and you have to teach psychology, you want to take it at 7 30 in the morning next quarter? Hi. There we go. Uh, you know, my students like my class. I'm super good out there. It's a great place to meet. Yeah. Uh, but we're not going to talk about that. We are here to talk about implicit bias and disability. And we have an excellent speaker uh, today with us, Dr. Sheila Northrup. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> <laughs> she just became a doctor, but we're sort of saying over and over again. So excited for her as a video. So, uh, Dr. Northrup is an educator and advocate. Her work focuses influencing on her work focuses on influencing public policy and discussions, including people with disabilities as full citizens and stakeholders in their communities. She has a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution. Awesome, by the way. It's a mouthful. Yeah, it is a mouthful. It's a great mouthful. And a master's degree in communication and leadership. So, for this conversation, the presentation is going to focus on the ways language, attitudes, stigma, and technology can impact people with disabilities and how disability should be considered when discussing implicit bias as well as equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I want us to take note in this discussion, we're going to have a chance to have a panel up here of other guests and to be dialoguing with them and asking them questions. And I want us to all think about um, asking those questions and engaging in curiosity and being courageous while respecting um, the interests of who we have on this panel. You know, these are people that are part of our community and we want to respect them and our questions and how we dialogue with them. So that's very important. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Northrup to get us going. <laughs> Someday I'll get used to that, but I'm not used to that quite yet. Okay. So some of my um, okay here we go uh, there. So some of my public speaking students are here. So welcome. Thank you for joining me. Uh, this is not often that I get to do this because I usually teach public speaking online. And people are like, uh, public speaking online, but this is how we do it, exactly this way. Um, I am also teaching an intro to communication class this quarter, so they'll get to see this too. Um, what I'm going to do in the spirit of teaching good public speaking uh, is walk you through, while I do this, uh, the appropriate way to give a presentation particularly when you want to consider your audience um, and if there are people with disabilities in your audience. Uh, that's why you see behind me the live captioning. Um, I try to use it every place I go because I feel like it's really important. Uh, plus, I use captions. When, I, when I'm a participant, I love having captions. So this is really important to me. One of the things we do when we give a good presentation is read what's on the screen. Uh, I went to a conference that was all PhD students with disabilities in Toronto in April. And I sat at a table with about four doctorate students who were all completely blind. And our presenters refused to read what was on the screen. Uh, they had their presentation, they had their slides, but they wouldn't read what was on the screen because they already knew what was there and assumed that everybody else in the room could read it as well. So the woman that I was sitting next to leaned over and said, what is, what is going on? I don't understand. So I was reading to her what was on the screen, and the presenter got upset with me and called me out for talking during his presentation, which gave the room at large an opportunity to explain to him that he wasn't doing this the way it needed to be done. So I'm going to read everything that's on the slides because that's the way an accessible presentation should be done. Ableism 
is really the final frontier. Even the very most progressive and forward-thinking spaces are so often casually and egregiously, egregiously ableist and inaccessible. It's always an afterthought until a disabled person points it out. A little bit about me. I was born six weeks premature I, in Colorado, so they wouldn't let me leave the hospital until spring because it was too cold. Um, they didn't know at the time why I was born prematurely, but at about six months old, my parents noticed that I wasn't doing typically developing things for an infant. So they took me into the doctors and the doctor said, well, she's got cerebral palsy. She probably won't walk. She probably won't talk. And in her case, she probably won't live past three. That sort of set the tone for me growing up. Um, as a kid, I was completely ambulatory. Uh, I had a brace that you can see in that picture. Um, I sometimes wore a brace on my left arm, but that was usually at night. Um, and then about four years ago now, I think we're going, when I really started my doctorate intensely, I, went, I underwent a corrective surgery. The corrective surgery was supposed to make it easier for me to walk, and it was supposed to relieve pain. It didn't do either. My pain is less, but now I can't walk as well as I could or as far as I could before. So I'm an ambulatory wheelchair user. For a lot of people, that's a strange concept. They think if we use wheelchairs, we're in wheelchairs all the time. They use words like chair bound. I'm not chair bound. I can get out of my chair. I can move around. Um, but my change in health uh, kind of drove my dissertation at that point. I was already looking at disability policy. Um, but all of a sudden, what happened for me was that I was living it in the worst way possible. <laughs> We would show up to places that we would want to get into as a family, and there would be stairs. And my husband could get in, and my kids could get in, but I couldn't get in. Or we would ask for disabled seating at like the Tacoma Rainiers, whatever. I sat in one place, the rest of my family sat in another. So what I wanted to do for my research was really focus on the disability experience from disabled people's point of view. My university told me, no, you can't do that. They're a vulnerable population, and it takes special consideration, and I would have had to go through a lot of paperwork to, to interview people with disabilities. I was really frustrated by that. So my next best option was to go to social media and to look at social media to see what people with disabilities were saying on social media to see what the conversation about disability was on social media. So what I have is a collection of screenshots. I have 4,000 of them. We're not going to go through 4,000 today. <laughs> um, these are things I didn't know four years ago when I started this process. I didn't know there were such things as models of disability. I didn't know that you could claim disability as an identity. Right? I grew up with the impairment model. Um, I grew up before ADA was actually a thing in 1990. Um, and I grew up in a household that was not comfortable with the idea of having disability. I was encouraged to pass, pass for able body as much as I possibly could. So that's what I did. Um, and I didn't know that there was a thing called ableism. I had no idea what that was. Um, and I learned that language matters a lot. Um, disability is inclusive, it doesn't discriminate. Uh, adults with disabilities in terms of ethnicity and race, I have to tell you, uh, because it's not on the slide, I got this statistic from the Center for Disease Control. That hurt my heart a little bit, that I had to find information on disability tied to disease. And while I recognize that some disability comes from disease, the fact that that's where this came from was kind of disturbing for me. So uh, American Indian, Native Alaskan, three in 10 have a disability. Black Americans, one in four. White Americans, one in five. Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, one in six. 
Hispanic, one in six, and Asian, one in 10. Um, pretty much anybody can have a disability. Disabilities can be both congenital and acquired. I considered myself to have both because I had a congenital disability, I got it at birth, and then the surgery gave me additional disability. Um, disability may not discriminate, but people do. Unconscious bias refers to a bias that we're unaware of and which happens outside of our control. Implicit bias refers to the same area, but questions the level to which these biases are unconscious, especially as we are being made increasingly aware of them. Um, I struggle with these concepts a little bit. And the reason that I struggle with the idea of unconscious or implicit bias is because as I did my research for my doctorate, the bias that faces minorities, but particularly dis people with disabilities, is built into the law, right? We have laws that say a certain amount of discrimination is okay. There's wording in the Americans with Disabilities Act that says accommodations must be reasonable, but reasonable is left undefined. Sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's really not. Um, so we can talk about this as part of our discussion, whether we think um, bias is implicit or unconscious or whether we live in a culture and a society that really has set up bias from the very beginning. Ableism, this was a big one for me. I, didn't, I, didn't, I knew about racism, I knew about sexism, I knew about homophobia, I knew about all those things, but I didn't know that a thing called ableism existed. A system that places value on people's bodies and minds based on societally constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, and excellence. These constructed ideas of normalcy, intelligence, and excellence are deeply rooted in anti-blackness, eugenics, and capitalism. This form of systematic oppression leads people and society leads to people and society determining who is valuable, worthy, and worthy based on people's appearance and or their ability to satisfactorily produce and excel and behave. You do not have to be disabled to experience ableism. Uh, what I found in my research is that ableism is systematic and institutional. It's pervasive. Uh, it's in people's attitudes. It's in the language we use. It's in policy, procedure, and law. Uh, disability is diversity and identity. From here on out, this is none of this is none of my posting. These is all things that I collected, right? Disability is diversity. Disabled people do have a history and a culture. We are a community. We are not solely defined by the problems we face. We are not just there to be fixed. We deserve to have the diverse and varied identity that is disability more recognized. The other one says, I really wish people understood how much power there is in claiming the word disabled and letting go of the shame that we're taught to have about our bodies and brains. Disabled isn't a negative word. It connects us to a community, culture, and identity that is powerful. Uh, there are two main models of disability. One is the medical model. The medical model is the model given to us by the medical community that has been around for centuries that says the body is impaired and needs to be fixed. Um, in, in recent years, in the last eh, 20, 30 years, uh, the social model has become a model that's used as well. The social model is the model that says the person has an impairment, but it's society that makes us disabled, right? It's the stairs that don't let me into a building. It's the fact that there's not a Braille book available in the bookstore for a student, right? Um, I don't like either of these models because I don't think they're quite complete enough. They don't tell the full story. At the end of the day, my house, which is semi-accessible, doesn't change the fact that I can't walk from my bed to the bathroom without worry about, worrying about maybe I might fall down, right? My body is still impaired. Um, so I don't think this is enough. Uh, I ran across this one in a talk that I share with my classes. It's called the biopsychosocial model. Um, it deals with the fact that there are multiple facets to disability. You have the biology, you have the psychology, and you have the social. I think this comes probably the closest to recognizing disability in its fullness. Um, I still don't exactly like it. 
And the part that kills me about this particular slide is that it's not accessible. And I know it's not accessible and I chose it on purpose to show you that oftentimes when we talk about disability, we do so in a way that even makes talking about it inaccessible. This, is, this was for a DSHS, right? This was on a slide for people who determine disability status. But if you work in the field and you have a disability, this slide isn't necessarily accessible to you. Um, this is supposedly the ideal model of disability. I like this one probably the best, right? An impairment plus a barrier equals a disability. That's what we have now. What we need to move to is people have impairments, right? If one in four, one in five of us have an impairment, we're not out of the ordinary. In fact, we are very ordinary. We are all around, so our environment should be available to all of us, right? We should have an accessible environment. Um, language, your words, attitudes, and actions impact my life more than my disability. Um, I think that's true for the most part for many people with disabilities, how other people treat us uh, affects our ability to move about in society both physically and literally, or literally and figuratively, um, in a way that doesn't allow us to be full citizens, right? I was reading an article the other day uh, from a gentleman who acquired a spinal cord injury, and it was Suicide Awareness Month, so he was talking about suicide, and he said, it's not my disability, it wasn't my car accident that makes me want to commit suicide. He said, it's the stuff that people say to me it's the fact that I can't get into buildings. It's the fact that my doctors don't take my pain level seriously, right? He said, it's not my body that makes me want to commit suicide. It's the way people treat me and my body. It's okay to say the D word. When you say differently able or definitely able, I have a hard time even saying that one, or special needs or inspirational, you mean I'm avoiding saying the word. I think disability is a dirty word but I don't see you as disabled. I see you as a beautiful, unique, and capable human being. So you're implying that disability can't be beautiful, or that disabled people aren't unique, or worse, that disabled people aren't even human. Disabled isn't a bad word. Um, in an effort to be more, I don't know, politically correct, I'm not sure why they decided to come up with the phrase special needs. Um, they didn't use the phrase special needs when I was growing up. But by the time I had my kids, special needs was the term that was used rampantly to describe disability. Uh, the problem with the phrase special needs is that there are people then think your needs aren't the same as everybody else's, that they are somehow unique or extra. We have the same needs as everybody else. It might take different things to get our needs met, but we have the same needs. What's happened now like with many words, is that the phrase special needs is starting to become pejorative. I have a, a slide where we'll get to that. Um, person first language problems. This is, this is a big fight right now in the world of academia, in special ed versus parents versus people with disabilities. Um, how we describe who we are and what we do. Okay, this slide says this is how person first language, person with autism sounds to a lot of autistics. Autism cannot be extracted from the, pers from the personality, and therefore, most autistics prefer identity first language, autistic people. Uh, but, if you, but you should always ask the individual and say whatever they prefer, not what you prefer. So on the slide it says, person with autism, person with gay, person with blind, person with Norwegian. Uh, when you put it that way, it, 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 one, it's a mouthful, um, and two, it doesn't necessarily put the person first. Um, I don't mind being just called disabled. As a, as a kid and as a teenager, I was vehemently that that, adamant that that was not me. I was not disabled, right? Anything I could do to hide it, I did. Um, this, was, this was a screenshot of a, a news story, actually. Mother's autistic child area sign is defaced, changed to child with autism in Garden City, right? Um, they actually made this child and his family's life worse 
by, by trying to correct the sign, right? You deface the sign for the sake of what? Making yourself comfortable, right? If how people refer to themselves and their disability makes you uncomfortable, you really ought to ask yourself why, right? Why am I so com uncomfortable with the idea of disability and how we talk about it? Language and identity. Oh, this is a fantastic slide. The reason that this is a fantastic slide is because it shows you how to make your social media posts accessible. Uh, see where it's, it says, hell yeah, tweet from G.H. Mansfield. It's striking the lengths that non-disabled people will go to to argue that they know the best identity or identifier. And it's, see where it says more? All you have to do when you're posting a slide or something is do it in plain language first, right? So screen readers can pick those up. Uh, so we get down there, he says, or identifier for hashtag disabled people. This presumptuous paternalistic attitude is a hallmark of ableism. Disabled people are the sole arbiters of our identity. Um, here we go with the attitudes in the pejorative language. Listen, folks, it's easy to think the United States is going backwards, but this country is much more progressive than Americans realize. We had our first black president, and now we have our first special needs president. Lovely Twitter post, there you go. Um, this is why we're fighting the term special needs, because it's used as pejorative, much like the word retarded, right? The words special needs, retarded, idiot, and moron all used to be medical diagnoses. Every single one of them in the early 1900s was a medical diagnosis that went in forms, people knew exactly what it meant, um, and so they became derogatory terms, right? And we hear them all the time. Don't be an idiot, don't be a moron. I still catch myself in the middle of that sentence, or I still catch myself saying things like, this makes me insane, this makes me crazy. All of that is language that stigmatizes disability and mental health, and we need to move away from that. Um, no amount of smiling at a flight of stairs has ever made it turn into a ramp, ever. Stella Young on why saying the only disability in life is a bad attitude is bullshit. The part about this that I love that, but the part about this that breaks my heart is that Stella Young died a couple years ago. Sally Young died because she had a medical emergency, and because of her disability, her medical emergency wasn't dealt with fast enough. She didn't have to die. Stigma and stereotypes. Disabled person. I can't do this, ableist. Yes, you can, but using your disability is an excuse. The only disability in life is a bum, 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 bad attitude. Disabled person. I can do this, ableist. Then you're not really disabled, you're just faking which is offensive to actual disabled people. I've had people tell me on my totally ambulatory days where I don't use my chair, I might have a cane or a walker, that I am not disabled enough to park in a disabled placard, in a disabled placard area, right? For some reason, of all the things that people feel they have a right to comment on, is people's disability, right? You, for some reason, general public has a right to tell me that I'm not able, disabled enough to do A, B, or C, uh, they're surprised when I'm out with my kids that I have kids, uh, hence the inappropriate questions about my personal life, but they're totally fine and comfortable in asking them. Um, I appreciate all the work Shriner does for disabled kids, but I didn't let my disability stop me. Super crit commercials are harmful. Sometimes our disabilities do stop us, and that should be respected. Also, other times disabilities and inaccessibility stop us from achieving our goals. It has nothing to do with our attitudes. Internalized ableism and infantilization. Um, I'm going to deal with the smaller posts first, or the less wordy posts first. It says, why do people with disabilities get held to higher standards than the rest of society? I would like to say sorry for swearing to absolutely no one. Uh, particularly with intellectual or developmental disability, people are held to a completely different standard. Um, they are treated like children their whole lives when they shouldn't be. They are adults who are capable of living adult lives. I have another slide in another presentation that has a guy with Down syndrome asking his caregiver if his girlfriend can stay the night. Caregiver says, nope, absolutely not. Well, and the, you know, and the guy looks at him and says, is your girlfriend staying the night? 
and the guy gets real sheepish, right? And this other one, uh, it says, typical conversation in parents of blind children groups. Parent posts something super offensive and horrible, not even in a I'm just learning about blindness and still grieving kind of way, but in a smug, I'm a blind mom and I want to show you what a martyr I am sort of way. Blind adult says the thing is offensive. Blind adult too spouts a bunch of ableist BS about why the thing is not offensive. Parent thinks blind adult too and is even more smug. I make a list of things in my apartment I can throw at the wall. Um, there is a huge push in the disabled community communities for people with disabilities to be the ones who have a say, more so than the parents. Like in the autistic community right now, there are parents who believe feeding their kids bleach will cure their autism. Despite the fact that there are autistic adults who say that doesn't work, that's child abuse, why would you do that? And the parent's response is, I'm the parent, it's my child, I get to determine what happens to them. Disabled people don't get a lot of autonomy. Other people are constantly making decisions about our bodies for us uh, that they generally think are on our behalf, but they're usually not. Um, together, we can combat ableism. Accessibility is not about addressing additional, extra, or special needs of disabled people. Accessibility is about breaking down barriers that exclude disabled people. Amy says, I need help moving around because my body doesn't always cooperate. I hear that. I need help eating because I need food to survive and don't have motor coordination, motor plan, and skill to prepare my food or eat in a way that is safe. I need a device or a letter board to communicate with words because I have thoughts. I have a voice. I have, I have a voice. I need dignity. I need respect. Those are my needs. They are not special needs. They are human needs. Uh, again, right, we need to get away from this idea that disability is somehow special or unique. It's not. If one in four of us in this room or one in four people has a disability, that's a lot of people in this room already, right? Um, loving access, hashtag love is access. There is a campaign going around called hashtag Hashtag access is love. Access is a practice of love, which wit, when done, when it is done in service of care, solidarity, and disability justice. Um, I like that, right? I like the idea that we shouldn't feel obligated or legally bound to make places accessible or teaching materials accessible or conference materials accessible um, because that's what we're supposed to do but because we want to, because we want people included. Um, loving access versus legal access. I was told today I should be grateful for a business trying to be accessible. Expecting a disabled person to be grateful for accessibility is like telling an able person to be grateful for utensils at a restaurant, doorknobs, nozzles on a gas tank, and lanes on the street. Political organizations, this, this one I included for my own sake and self because when I went to this conference on disability for disabled scholars, this was our day. Our day was so incredibly jam-packed that not even halfway through it, most of us were like, you gotta stop, we're tired. Most of us had, it was in Toronto, so most of us traveled a really long way and traveling with a disability is, a, it's a whole nother talk, it's a whole nother talk. Um, Political organizers and activists, sustainability, disability justice, and capitalism and ableism, healing justice, also political organizations and activists. National conference starts at 7 a.m., breakfast, workshops, plenaries all day. Film screening, part, film screening, party, and performances end at 10. Living with a disability takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to sometimes do things that most people take for granted. I have days where I don't make it out of bed, right? And at first, I really beat myself up over that. I had a lot of internalized ableism because I wasn't being productive in my day, right? I wasn't contributing as, as a social citizen. My worth was tied to my productivity. My worth is inherent in being a human being, 
everybody's worth is inherent in being a human being. But this idea that we have that you're only worthwhile if you're productive is dangerous for people with disabilities. Um, making room for everybody. This is where we get to the kind of technology end of things, right? There's a significant, significant difference between all are welcome here and this space was created with you in mind. Build accessibility into design and then we won't have to worry about this. It's not a matter of, okay, we made a restroom, now let's add an accessible equipment. That will always be less functional. Build accessibility in from the start. New York just built a new library, not accessible. They spent millions and millions of dollars on a library that's not fully accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and I said this at another conference and a woman, a woman got really upset with me as she stood up and she said, the planning committee was supposed to take care of that. And she got in my face and I was like, yeah, but there was nobody on the planning committee with a disability. Okay. <laughs> you know, if, if you don't invite people with disabilities to be part of the process, it will never be fully accessible. If you don't hear what we're saying, if you don't hear our voices, um, then no amount of accessible afterthought will be helpful. Um, you can practice empathy. A lot of people are like, I had a guy ask me, what do we do? How do we fix this? Be patient and practice empathy, right? One doesn't have to operate with great malice to do great harm. The absence of empathy and understanding are sufficient. I had a conversation with a guy the other day. I've been working on getting some buildings in my neighborhood accessible. And one of the guys that's in charge of the buildings wouldn't meet with me, wouldn't hear me out, wouldn't have anything to do with me until his mom needed to temporarily move, use a wheelchair, right? And he had a hard time getting his mom into the building. And once he had had that experience, all of a sudden he was ready to listen. He was ready to hear what I was saying. How to treat disabled people? Just treat them like people. That's literally it. You can speak up and you can speak out. If you don't see race, you don't fight racism. If you don't see disability, you don't fight ableism. If you don't see gay or straight, you don't fight homophobia. If you don't see trans or cis, you don't fight transphobia. Stop, shrink stop shirking responsibility with ignorance, okay? Most of what gets shared as heartwarming stories are usually temporary small-scale responses to systematic failures. I wish we found it just as inspirational to make structural changes to unjust systems, but I don't know if our culture knows how to tell those stories. I would add yet to that. I would like us to get to a point where we can tell those stories. Um, I got into it, I don't get into it on Facebook with people very often, but I got into it with an educational organization on Facebook over sharing a story of a teacher who took a young lady with cerebral palsy. They were going on some sort of hike to a waterfall uh, the young lady uses a wheelchair and the field trip wasn't accessible. So the teacher strapped her to his back in a giant carrier. And everybody celebrated how fantastic this teacher was for strapping her to his back and taking her up this waterfall so that she could see the beauty of it. And literally, all I commented on, all I said was, how about just have an accessible field trip instead? One where she could move about on her own. And I was so virally attacked for simply suggesting that she have the autonomy to move on her own that I, I, like, I had to unfollow the page and block it. I was like, oh, I have to find a happy place because these people are, are going to tell me that I'm wrong because we would rather celebrate able-bodied people being charitable than make the world accessible to people with disabilities. You can listen without judgment. Uh, this, one, this one causes consternation when I tell people this. Uh, to refuse to listen to someone's cries for justice and equality until the request comes in the language you feel comfortable with is a way of asserting your dominance over them in the situation. If people want to swear at you when they are frustrated and angry and they let off a string of F-bombs because they've been trying all quarter to get you to listen as a professor for their accessibility needs, they're gonna swear at you and you can't be like, oh, you know what, you have to talk to me nicely or I won't listen to you. Um, ADA is almost 30 years old and we still have to fight for accessibility. The burden of enacting ADA falls on disabled people. It doesn't fall on businesses or the government. 
Um, and people are tired of this. They've been tired of this for a long time. But if we have to be polite all the time, then we're not getting heard either. Um, on the record, access, inclusion, representation, good places to begin. By all means, let's improve those. Seems to me that agency, equity, and power would likely fix those things, but they don't get as much attention. Have you ever wondered why? This is why. This is why agency, power, and access don't get as much attention. Because we talk a lot about diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion asks who's in the room. Equity and social justice responds, who's, to try, who's trying to get into the room but cannot? Whose presence in the room is under constant threat of erasure or minimization? Diversity and inclusion asks, has, have everyone's ideas been heard? Equity and social justice responds, whose ideas will not be taken seriously because they aren't in the majority? Um, I had an experience recently where someone asked me what I needed to make a presentation accessible. And I said, I need the following things. And they said, you don't really need those. I said, I need a mic. They said, you don't need a mic. You have a loud voice. Everybody in the room can hear you. I said, it's not about the fact that I have a loud voice and everybody in the room can hear me. It's about the fact that a mic makes things more accessible for people. It's easier to hear. Um, so even as I was talking about fighting ableism and making spaces more accessible, the group that I was working with was fighting me on accessibility, right? Diversity inclusion asks how many more, pick any minoritized identity group, do we have this year than last? Equity and social justice responds, what conditions have we created that maintain groups as a perpetual majority here? Diversity and inclusion asks, is this environment safe for everyone to feel like they belong? Equity and social justice challenges. Whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized to allow others to be comfortable maintaining their dehumanizing views? Diversity and inclusion asks, is it separatist, isn't it separatist to provide funding for safe spaces and separate student centers? Equity and social justice answers, what are people experiencing that they do not feel safe when isolated and separated from others like themselves? Diversity and inclusion asks, we had Black Lives Matter activists here last year, so this year we should invite someone from the alt-right. Wouldn't it be great if we had a panel discussion on Black Lives Matter? And equity and social justice answers, why would we allow the humanity and dignity of people to be subject to debate or the target of harassment and hate speech? Disability is still the subject of debate. Our bodies are still the subject of debate what rooms we're allowed into, whether a building is grandfathered in, right? We deal with this kind of stuff all the time. Our humanity is determined by someone else's experience. As part of my research, I talked about, um, I think it was Iceland. Iceland was bragging that they had reduced Down syndrome by 99%, right? Which means in prenatal screening, when down syndrome came up positive on the prenatal screening, those mothers were encouraged to abort those babies just because they had Down syndrome. I have several friends who have kids who have Down syndrome, and they're like, I can't imagine having aborted my child just because my child has Down syndrome. My child is a person just like everybody else. But because of the medicalization of disability, Disabled bodies and disabled people are always up for debate. Okay. Diversity and inclusion celebrates increasing population numbers that still reflect minoritized, minoritized status in the community, incremental growth and change, right? Don't push too hard. Do a little bit at a time, ease into it, don't do anything radical, don't piss anybody off. Okay? Equity and social justice celebrates reductions in harm revisions to abusive systems and increases in supports for people's life opportunities as reported by those most impacted. Diversity and inclusion celebrates awards for initiatives and credits itself for having a diverse candidate pool. One of the last, uh, one of the last presentations that I did was uh, for the Department of Health and Human Services. And as we were getting to the end of my presentation, 
I heard a woman in the back vehemently frustrated. So I asked her if she wouldn't mind sharing with the group what she was frustrated about. And she said, well, none of us actually need to hear this. I said, can you explain further? I don't understand. She said, we're all here voluntarily. We're already on this boat. We already want to make places more diverse and more inclusive. The people who need to hear this aren't in this room. They aren't at this conference because we don't want to offend anybody by asking for what we need. Okay? Equity and social justice responds, getting rid of practices and policies that have desperate impacts on minoritized groups, increase in numbers, retention, and success leadership of people of color or people with disabilities or people who are gay, right? Anybody who's not in the standard leadership position. I cannot tell you the number of organizations there are for people with disabilities and there is nobody in the leadership that actually has a disability. Um, we have a right to take up space. We have a right to be in the room. We have a right to be heard. If you don't know how to make a space or your language accessible, please ask. Someone with a disability will tell you we're not shy. Most of us, we've learned that we can't be, um, either by choice or by force. You know, one of my experiences as a kid, um, was I got to see doctors on a monthly and yearly basis. And one of, one of the experiences, and I'm kind of mortified telling you this, but I am gonna tell you this anyway. Yearly, because my dad was in the military, we were always at military bases. Military hospitals are teaching hospitals. So yearly, up until I was 12, I got to pray around a room full of doctors, usually all male, in my underwear. So they could look at my gait, so they could look at my hip length, so they could look at my arms, so they could look at my body and see if it was developing normally. I'm not sure we would do that anymore. Um, I would like to think that we wouldn't, but it was that experience as a 12 year old that I realized my body didn't belong to me, right? It belonged to the medical community. It belonged to people who decided um, whether they were going to follow my IEP. This summer, I went on a couple job interviews. Um, I like to teach, so I'm cool with adjuncting. Uh, eventually, I'd like a full-time job, but I was offered a job, and up front, I asked for my accommodation. And they said, yeah, no problem, we can totally do that. She said, I'll call you, I want you at the onboarding, you'll get an email with all the information, you know what? And, and please clear your schedule for that day and show up. A week went by, I didn't get a phone call or an email. And I heard from a friend who works at that place that they hired somebody else. They hired somebody else who didn't need the accommodation. How will we make places more accessible? That's a big, complicated conversation. But the thing that I would ask you to do first is make your mind accessible, right? Listen to people with disabilities when they talk. Listen to people whose experiences diverge from yours, right? I have a lot of friends with disabilities. None of our experiences are the same. We've all been treated the same, right? We've all had some what I would consider universal experiences uh, in being treated poorly, but none of us is the same. Um, I think it's time for questions, right? Can we get the projector turned off and can my panel join me up front? Yes, as long as that's okay with everybody else, absolutely. Thank you. So if we have some panelists here in the audience, I'm 
Okay, so why don't we read the question first? We're going to introduce ourselves. Well, after that, yes. And okay, sounds good. Hi, everyone. My name is Monica Olson. I work here at TPC. I'm the Access Services Manager. Hi, my name is Lindsay. I'm a student here at TCC for nursing. And um, yeah, I'm a disability student. Hi, my name is uh, Lee Barn. I am a uh, student here at TCC, where's a disability and a uh, disability advocate in the community here in Tacoma. And this thing and the uh, Y'all know who I am. So um, I'll tell you what, how about this? Why don't you hand me the questions, copy the questions, and I can read them. And then, and then we'll pass to my friend. Okay, panel of questions. Question number one. What are your thoughts on unconscious bias and implicit bias as it relates to disability? So I think the, um, this is a huge problem and one that I uh, actually, not until this presentation, fully realized. Um, which is shocking because I have a disability. Um, over a third of us um, tend to think that disabled people are not as productive as everyone else, which I think can be ludicrous. <laughs> um, because I am a student, I have classes, I pass classes, um, and I just have a kind of full time job. Uh, I might be a parent. In the future, so that's a bunch of weird things. Um, so I was, I actually didn't know where to go, so I missed your explanation, but I think I have a somewhat general understanding of what you mean. Um, this is a fairly new world for me. Um, like three years ago, I had. Uh, a traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness, and um, it was actually the third time that I've had an injury, but it was pretty severe. So, um, being that they're cumulative, I didn't always live like this from you know a young age. Um, so, and it's also an invisible illness in a lot of ways. Um, people meet me and they're they could, like they wouldn't think that you know I don't think. On the same level as a lot of other people, or I struggle cognitively. Um, but my biggest, so it's only been about a year, but um, that I've really been in college and experienced being um, like unable to do the things that I did before um, or as well. So the biggest one has been just getting people to understand that there are invisible disabilities um, and that they're very real and just because someone doesn't seem like they might be disabled doesn't mean that they're not um, and so a lot of times i'm treated like like i'm stupid <laughs> um, because they're like what's wrong with her you know um, but for the most part yeah it, it my also my big struggle with is that most professors are pretty kind here, but there have been a few where I've had to um, explain to them that the, the accommodations um, are not like an option for them. Um, they're kind of like, well, we'll see. And I'm like, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard because I'm not good at explaining things sometimes already, you know, especially on my bad days. And so um, I get serious. I don't want to have a bad relationship with, with professors and people of professional status and, and jobs. And I totally relate to what you said about jobs. Like if you tell them that you have a disability, like it's like, oh, like I'm having a hard time getting work study here um, because of that. But um, um, sorry, I just <laughs> Yeah, convincing teachers, um, you know, that it that it really is what I need to succeed. Um, and it makes all the difference in the world. And since Monica, you know, helped work with me, like 
you know, I can be an A student and, you know, be as successful as I was before. And like that, it's a big deal in somebody's life. So, you know, I would say don't always just assume that someone might not need something because they don't look incapable. Thank you, people. I before I share my response, I want to just be mindful of the time, and I realized that we said the event would end at twelve thirty. I know some people leave, so I want to defer to Dr. Sheila and Melissa. If we should continue the conversation or or not. Well, I'll tell you what. Does anybody out there have questions? We can do those first. <laughs> Yeah, I think we I think we found out our mic answer. So we're gonna have to turn one off. Or um, okay, so I'll I'll save my response okay. for another time and we can open it up to the Ah. <laughs> My question is, we're implementing a new policy at work and kind of part of it, and we want to include the, like, disability or build a new facility. Uh, you made a comment of, like, asking disabled people, like, what you need. How do you go about asking without organizing disabled people, like, you don't have one of them, you know, they can visually see. Right. So, in, in, oh, where is my mic? Um, so, in my experience, it's always been good to kind of shoot out an email and ask for volunteers, right? That the, the one disabled person in the room may not really want to be the disabled advocate on that day, right? I have days where I'm like, I don't want to do this today. I'm not up to this today. I just want to stay in bed. Right, uh, but for me, I think it's asking asking people to be included and then leaving it up to them. Um, I think it's important that people who are in charge of those things know what the laws are too. Right, ignorance is not an excuse. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act has been around for almost thirty years, so people who are involved in planning should know about it. Good question. Uh, this is um, really my question is eager. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, I think Sheila just gave you a great response. Some other advice I have are you could build a survey that people can respond to anonymously um, so that way they don't want to actually disclose their disability to the work group. They still have opportunity to provide input. Um, I think. In addition to people who are in charge of whatever project it is you're working on, I think you mentioned these spaces being developed. Um, in addition to knowing about the laws and the ADA, there are community resources and organizations that can provide guidance on accessible development. So one is the um, Northwest ADA Center. They have a hotline. Sheila likes them. I do. I love them. Um, they have a hotline, plus on their website, they actually have guidelines for designing buildings and spaces accessibly um, per ADA requirements. So there's like an actual packet you could download. Is that helpful? Very cool. <laughs> Other questions for any of those guys? Do you want to move? Would that be okay? Yeah. 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 How do you feel about the language adaptive to help describe the way you accommodate things? As a, for instance, I teach the example thing in our profession, calls the way we accommodate uh, different situations, not being able to see or you know, not being fully able to and uh, adaptive being, but I don't really have an opportunity to ask how a group of people feel about that language. I do not have to answer this one. If you guys want to do it, do it. Oh, that should be over real quick. Good question. 
And again, this is one that I, I'm someone who experiences a physical disability. Um, I think the term adaptive or the word adaptive is a little bit more common in like the sports arena when referring to disability. Personally, I don't find the word adaptive offensive or red flaggy in any way. The same way I would say I would find maybe like special team. Yes, that's um, totally true. Um, yep. So personally, I as an adaptive is another actual like biz term when we're talking about yep. technology. We might say adaptive technologies and the work that I do, for example, accommodating students. So that's my two cents. Um, and I'm glad you asked. I actually um, did um, scheme with a group um, that for disabled people, and I think adaptive is fine, but um, the organization was out for a stroll. Is that you? No, but I work with the organization. So um, that's a great organization, and you could uh, probably contact them and, um, for advice. Uh, well, mine obviously is not uh, Visible in that way. Um, no, I mean, disability is not an offensive word to me. Um, people are disabled in so many ways that aren't disabled sometimes because of other reasons, you know. Um, so, I, yeah, I think it's a pretty unoffensive word. But yeah, I don't think that the one that you said would be, I mean, if I was in their position, I wouldn't feel that invited. I mean, now, like retard or you know, mentally retarded or you know, even like mentally incapable is kind of like, hmm, I don't like that one either. So, um, because we are you know, capable, so um, yeah, I I'm good. I don't even have to say anymore. We might be able to sneak in one additional question. Hey, I'm Christopher. Uh, I work here. Uh, I also play adaptive sports. So I have a hand cycle. I do, I do adaptive cycling. My main sports is adaptive or uh, basketball, wheelchair basketball. Uh, anyway, so yeah, that's a cool thing. I play with the Metro Parks Adaptive Recreation Program. So yeah. Chris, I could see you playing rugby. First of all, I could <laughs> you have get be, you on the rugby. You have to be a quad. To play. Oh, do you? First of all, yeah. <clears throat> Whatever. Even if it's too late for that sport. I do play basketball aggressively. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any other last questions or comments from our audience members? Well, let's give, oh, you do have one more. Okay. Um, I can just, if it's loud enough for it. Do you mind coming over yes. to people online? Sure. Is there the what's next from this point? Are you going to be covering that? Like, now that you, Collaborate or you know, come to listen to what we have to say. There are collaboration opportunities, or was that not part we of We can that? make those, yeah. I like a call to action. I love that. Yeah. So always send us back to here and maybe just have something you'd like to end with for each of you that either calls people to action or is a summary statement of how you're feeling. Because I teach communication, my call to action is to listen. Listen when people talk to you about what they need. If you are not listening, if you are not actively listening, if you are not empathetically listening to what is happening to someone else in their experience, you won't be able to change it. My um, my call to action is to be engaged. I'm on the advisory body for the city for disabilities, and on occasion we do have some who do not have disabilities, and we love them like fully, <laughs> and they learn a lot. <laughs> and so, be engaged, ask questions. Most of us you know, ask us how to be accessible. We like, thank you. This is how. Yeah, absolutely. Um. Yeah, I don't, I don't have like a very specific one, but it's you know very much the same kind of with that. Um, that listening, listen is always a good thing with anybody. Um, 
but also people want to know about it all the time too. Like, and so when I do share it, and I'm very careful now about who I tell that I've had a brain injury because people will absolutely take advantage of you. Um, and so, you know, I would say that just be polite and, you know, hey, can you tell me about it? Would you feel comfortable? I know you probably talk about this stuff all the time, you know, um, but can I learn more? Because I want to, I want, like, you know, it's for a reason to spread information, obviously. It's a good thing. But if it's just to be, like, nosy, <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of annoying sometimes when just being totally honest. Um, but yeah, I just, um, just be empathetic, you know, imagine if, if it was you. I mean, you know, what would you feel like? What would you want to happen? I mean, that's good for anything. So I would say just, you know, put yourself in the same person's shoes and, and, and be conscientious of that, you know, um, when you're trying to help one or whatever it is. <laughs> awesome. We've got such great students here. <laughs> um, my call to action would be to recognize that disability can actually sometimes be a superpower and be wise in your group. And here's why. Um, many folks who have attention disabilities like ADD or ADHD uh, notice changes in the environment before you do. So when the zombies come to attack us, they're going to tell you first. Um, that's one example. I'm someone with a physical disability I've had my whole life, so I move around this world differently, I navigate some spaces differently, and so I'm always creatively thinking about how to make whatever space I mean not only work for me, but work for anyone who's coming after me, which means we're creative problem solvers and we think of things that you don't. So you want us on your team. Can we give them a round of applause? Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. We really appreciate you attending this great conversation, engaging with us. And thank you one more time to Dr. Northrup. She was amazing to share all of that with us. We have recorded this session. And um, if you are a staff member, we will send out via email. If you are a student, we will figure out how to get it to you if you would like it. So um, you can either contact myself, or I might work with um, Sonia Morgan, who's our director of student engagement. She was here earlier to maybe send something out to students. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and have a great rest of your day.